Hey everybody, welcome to Since Time Immemorial, Tribal Sovereignty in Washington State. My name is Mrs. Brown and I teach history at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School. And today we're going to be talking about something called the Fish Wars and the Bull Position. And those are two really, really, really important things in Washington State history for everyone, tribal and non-tribal people alike. So I'm excited that you're here. Sit back and let's learn. So our learning target today is to be able to explain the fish wars and what they were and why the Bolt decision is so important to the tribes of Washington. And so as you're watching the lesson, I want you to start thinking about monkey in the middle or keep away. Uh, some people call it different things, but I'm going to be comparing the fish wars to that game that you probably played when you were a kid. Uh, your task will be to explain the fish wars and the bolt decision to somebody else. You can do that in writing. You can do that just in a conversation, whatever you would like. So here we go. So let's do a little review of Monkey in the Middle. Uh, it's a game where you have two or more people on uh, either side of somebody in the middle. That's the monkey. And the two, two sides need to keep, it's usually a ball, keep a ball away from the monkey in the middle. If the monkey in the middle gets it, then they get to switch sides and somebody else gets to be the monkey in the middle. Uh, but this game has always uh, made me pause. And the reason why is because one of the things is, is that physical size really impacts the outcome. If you are short like me and you're in the middle, then the, the two taller sides have a really big advantage over me and maybe that's why I really don't like this game so much because what ends up happening for me, I hate this game, my, my family loves it but I hate it, is that I start getting frustrated because I'm short, I can't grab the ball, I can't get the ball and, um, and it just keeps on going back and forth and back and forth and finally I just get tired and I'm like, I don't wanna play anymore. And, um, and so that's one of the things about Monkey in the Middle that I want you to continue to keep in your mind. But then also, how does the game end? Because I always quit before, before it's over, because, or if it's over at all, because I just get tired. Or, you know, one of my kids gets tired and, and we just don't play anymore. So I've always wondered how the game ends. So I want you to keep those things in mind as we continue our journey. So one of the things that I want to review uh, is land-based values and colonization values or colonial values. Remember that land-based values are those indigenous values where the people believe that they are part of the environment, that they are just one of the millions of beings, except it's, it's their job to take care of the resources for future generations. So not living in the here and now, but thinking ahead. Whereas Judeo-Christian land values that led to those colonial values is that there is a dominion over the environment. And so that means that you have control over it, you get to use it, and you get to use it um, for the purposes that you want right now. So uh, remember land-based versus Judeo-Christian uh, worldviews. And remember, that's the, the um, colonist values. Not only do they have the Judeo-Christian values, but they cannot and will not recognize indigenous people as fully human. And so they view, they view these people as, as resources they can exploit or take advantage or uh, become indifferent to. And so those values come from those Judeo-Christian land values. And, uh, and I just wanted to review that because that plays a part in today's lesson. So what were the fish wars? Well, the fish wars, you can take a look at our, at our um, timeline. And our timeline says 1974, but it's actually just a little bit further back than that because we have, um, we have a fight, a war between the tribes of Washington and Oregon, and we're gonna be focusing on Washington, and the states of Washington and Oregon, and again, we'll be focusing on Washington, and it's all about fish. And so you might be thinking, you know, what do people have to fight about when it comes to fish? 
Well, here we go. There is a video that I want you to pause and and go ahead and watch. It's called The Four Simple Truths About the Fish Wars. And uh, I won't explain a whole lot to you, except that it does give you just a really, really brief history of, of uh, the fish wars and the reasons for them. Because what ends up happening is that the states of Washington and Oregon start restricting and prohibiting Indians from fishing in what are called usual and accustomed fishing sites. And, you know, we get prohibited by the state to do a whole lot of things or not to do a whole lot of things a lot of times, except the state didn't have the right to do that because the Indian tribes of Washington and Oregon, they had secured that right to fish and hunt and gather in those usual and accustomed grounds when they made the treaties with the federal government. And so the federal government actually has more control over the state government. And so the states really couldn't do that. This video is really, really, really um, informative and engaging, and I really hope that you watch it. But if you don't, I will have the transcript available for you. The transcript will be available for download or um, it'll be available at your school. So here we are with Monkey in the Middle. Remember, I asked you to remember that and talk about that. So what ends up happening is Oregon and Washington start playing monkey in the middle with the treaty tribes. And actually, they start it just as soon as they start settling. Uh, remember, their viewing, their worldview is that these resources are theirs for the taking. And so the treaty tribes, however, have... Um, have an agreement with the federal government that they should have access to fish in all of their usual and accustomed places. So it ends up like they're playing monkey in the middle, tossing the fish back and forth. And the treaty tribes are much smaller than the states of Oregon and Washington. And so they end up really losing. And, and, and it, um, it threatens their way of life, their identity, everything. Now, a few things to remember about the fish wars and the Bolt decision uh, were in the Four Simple Truths video that I just talked about earlier, but I wanted to touch on them here because they're really important. The first thing is that tribes, when they were negotiating treaties, they ceded or gave up land, but they did not give up their right to fish in their usual and accustomed places. And uh, it, it kind of would be like saying that you're going to live in your apartment um, and then you're just going to rely on what's available in your apartment for all of your food and how to make a living. And nobody in their right mind would do that. The tribes did not do that. They secured their rights to hunt, fish, and gather in all of their usual and accustomed places. The second thing that the video talks about is that the states of Washington and Oregon, they've actually prevented Indians from fishing. And as we talked about uh, just a moment ago, states can't do that because that's actually violating federal law. Federal treaties are federal law and federal law is more powerful than state law. The next thing that um, happens with the fish wars is that the, the treaty tribes in the area, they start mobilizing. That means gathering their resources, gathering their plans, and then they begin protesting to get public awareness. And then they fight. They fight for their right to fish. And then the last thing is that um, and we won't we won't see it so much in this lesson, but in future lessons that you'll have uh, throughout your middle school and high school careers is that racism played a major role in the states of Washington and Oregon in the, the laws that they passed to harass and prohibit Indian fishers. So again, what were the fish wars? This is coming from uh, an amazing book called The State We're In. It's by the League of Women Voters. And they explain what the fish wars are. And, uh, and this text is also available uh, in, in paper paper form, but um, I also have it here because it's it's short and it also really, really explains what the fish wars were. 
So I'm going to start. So so when when Indians entered into those treaties with the federal government, they gave up a lot of land. But again, remember, they did not give their right up to hunt, fish and gather in usual and accustomed places. And so most of those places were not on the reservations. And at the time, nobody thought anything of it. It was it seemed OK because there was plenty of land and resources to go around. Only it doesn't stay that way. The population grows, the population of the settlers grows. And what ends up happening is that you have all of these um, white people who are fishing for a living. In fact, it becomes a major industry. And remember those colonial um, land values, that worldview is that I want to make as much as I can, I want to do as much as I can for me here and now. And so what that major industry in fishing did is it uh, prevented uh, Indian fishing in the places where they had had fished for thousands of years since time immemorial. And the thing about that is that it wasn't just that, you know, they had state laws against that. The overfishing that happened, the development of dams, pollution, all kinds of, of factors that come from that um, Judeo-Christian land value, that worldview comes into play. And so there are less and less fish. And remember that the identity of Northwest tribes, the collective identity, is, is, is about salmon. Salmon is so important. And so restricting salmon fishing was something that was a threat not only to culture, but also just to basic livelihood. And so the states took to arresting um, arresting fishers, and you can see right here, David Leach is being arrested and um, actually, you know, thrown into what's called a paddy wagon. And his crime was fishing. His crime was exercising his treaty right. And what Washington and Oregon did is that they would confiscate or they would take away the boats and the fishing nets. But by this time, um, most tribal people are so poor that taking away a boat, you can't just go get another boat. You just can't get some more fish nets. And so it really prevented them from making a living, from feeding their families. And that's where a lot of the anger starts building is because, is because these tribes have this right, but they're not being allowed to exercise it by by governments that don't have the right to, to, to prohibit them in the first place. So what I'm giving you here is just a brief overview of the fish wars. And I want to pause and let you know that there are so many powerful, amazing Indian activists who really fought and made it possible for you to have salmon on your table today. Here's a picture of just some of them back in 64. Janet Cloud, McLeod and her husband Don. And then right next to them, right next to them is a man named Billy Frank Jr. Billy Frank Jr. is legendary. He was instrumental in, in um, the fish wars and also all of the legislation and treaty rights work that has happened since then. And uh, he died recently but he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That's the highest civilian honor. This guy is a big deal. And then next to him, Al Bridges, also, um, also an activist as is Herman Johns, Nugent Kautz, and Jack McLeod. These are just some. And in fact, I will, I will post some videos for you to take a look at that, uh, that have, have stories of the fish wars in their own words. So. Uh, just really important people. So I briefly just wanted to talk about Billy Frank Jr. Um, he was 14 when he was first arrested by the state game wardens for fishing. and He became a leader of the Indian fishing rights movement in the 60s. He led the fish in protests in, this, in the Nisqually River that won the support of many people. And th those fish ins, they resulted in the Bolt decision. Another instrumental activist was Ramona Bennett, and she is a citizen of the Puyallup Nation 
and she was elected to the Puyallup Tribal Council in 1968 and elected as chairwoman in 1971. That's like the president. And she held that position until 1978. Uh, in addition to her fishing rights advocacy, she participated in the takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs building in Washington, DC in 1972. And she helped take over Tacoma's Cushman Hospital in 1976. She also opened the doors for women activists by actively fighting attempts during the 1970s to exclude her from national tribal chairman's conferences. So then the wars come about. Remember I said mobilization happens and so in the in the 60s you see a lot more people who are fighting and standing up for for those uh, tribal treaty rights, for those Indian fishing rights. And so finally through all of the protests and the mobilization and getting the word out and educating people, the U.S. government finally acts to protect the, um, the fishing rights and they sue the state of Washington to allow uh, natives to fish. So then from the fish wars comes the Bolt decision. So what is the Bolt decision? Well, it's about this guy here, George Bolt. He's a judge, he's a federal judge. And in 1974, he ruled on this case. And he ruled that, that Indian fishers had rights in common with everyone else. And so to know what that means, um, he, he went to uh, an old, old dictionary from 1828 to see what that means. And that was at the signing of the treaty and in common meant half. And so he ruled that, that Indians were entitled to half of the harvestable salmon. And then he also ruled that tribes should partner up with the state to manage and protect salmon. Imagine how that's going to go. So you have these, these states of Oregon and Washington, and, uh, and they, are, they are supposed to partner with tribes, with the treaty tribes, to protect salmon. And I can't imagine what it would have been like the first few times that the state and the treaty tribes met, but I'll bet it was pretty dramatic. And the good news is, is that the partnership has grown and evolved, and it took a long time for the state to really uh, recognize treaty tribes and Indian fishers as experts in, tr in fishery management. But they came along and, and now there are some pretty strong partnerships between the state of Washington and our treaty tribes. So then the Bolt decision was a really big deal. It was a victory for Indians and the salmon. And today tribal governments have a lot of people working to restore streams and rivers that have been polluted or damaged during the last century. Tribes have also helped educate the public about the connection between healthy rivers, healthy salmon, and healthy people. And the two major organizations that do that are the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, that's their logo at the top, and the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. The Bolt decision is famous because it confirmed that the treaties have to be respected. It encouraged tribes all over the United States and Native people in other countries to insist on their rights. It also led to a flowering of Indian culture in our state because the salmon are a central part of Indian life. Many Indians who had moved away from the reservations came home again. The Bolt decision more than any other event made it clear to everyone that Indian culture, history, and identity are here to stay. So now let's do a Bolt decision review, shall we? So let's take a look at number one, or the check number one, the states of Washington and Oregon, they restricted Indian fishing rights all over their states. And so this violated the treaty right to fish in the usual and accustomed sites outside the reservation boundaries. Remember usual and accustomed is a really important phrase that you will hear a lot in Washington state. And then the tribes sued the state of Washington and won. And so the presiding judge, federal judge George Hugo Bolt, he reaffirmed treaty fishing rights. And really it should be re-re-reaffirmed treaty fishing rights because 
because tribes around this area had been fighting and fighting since treaties were signed to be able to exercise their treaty rights. Judge Bolt also declared that tribes were entitled to half of the salmon and that tribes and the state of Washington must partner to protect salmon habitat. So let's review the four simple truths video. Number one, tribes ceded land when they signed the treaties, but they did not give up the right to fish in their usual and accustomed grounds. Remember that phrase. States prevented tribes from fishing and states can't do that because federal treaties are above state laws. And Indians and non-Indians alike mobilized, educated people, protested, got national and international attention and fought to affirm the treaty right to fish. Racism played a major role in the fish wars because, because you don't want to have, you don't want somebody else to have what you can't have. And so it, it really was a, a violent and ugh, ugly time. And racism was, was at the root of that. And so here we are at the end of our lesson. I asked you at the beginning of the lesson to think about how the fish wars were like playing a game of keep away or monkey in the middle. And size definitely plays a, uh, plays a factor because Washington and Oregon, the, those governments were a lot bigger and a lot more powerful than the treaty tribes at that time. And you know the actual keep away is between Washington and Oregon keeping salmon away from the treaty protected native fishers. And then we have to think about did did the Bolt decision really end the fish wars? And unfortunately, it really didn't. There are a whole lot of court cases out there that uh, that deal with the right to fish, the treaty right to fish. And really, like monkey in the middle, only when someone gets tired and gives up and goes home, will the fish wars actually end. Remember in monkey in the middle, I've never known how the game ended. I'd get angry and it's like, oh, I'm done with this. Or somebody would get tired. The thing is here, the thing that I want you to really know is that the treaty tribes will never, ever give up their right to fish in their usual and accustomed grounds. And they keep fighting to this day to maintain that treaty right. And so the next part is, was the Bolt decision fair? And so you take a look at Judge Bolt reaffirming treaty rights to fish, saying that Indians are entitled to half of the harvestable catch in Washington waters, and that the tribes must share equal partnership with the state in maintaining and protecting salmon habitat. And so if you had been the judge, would you have made a different decision? And what would it have been and why? And that's what I want you to think about. And I would love for you to discuss these with somebody else. You can also write them, um, write down your, your uh, points or even start writing in a paragraph. But I really want you to, I really want you to take this task seriously because Knowing the story of the fish wars and the Bolt decision, and so then realizing and understanding the treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather in usual and accustomed grounds makes the understanding of current events in Washington state a whole lot easier. And, it, and, it, and things really start connecting and making sense. So thank you, you guys, for listening and go off and do your task and I'll see you next time.